verse 42, 43. The nature of the universe is indescribable, for it is a vast, a heaven of unimaginable diversities. Therefore, the conscious principle or permeval doer is indescribable and has unlimited power and capacities. He is the source of all power and therefore can lead all seekers. He is the way. I want to elaborate this point by giving an example, Himalekha said. When employers are pleased with the honest service of their employees, they reward them accordingly. The Lord of the universe is full of compassion and all the desires of his devotees are fulfilled. A true seeker is desireless. Rich people are generally greedy, ungrateful and lack compassion. Whatever is obtained from them is trivial and short-lived. But the merciful Lord, who is all-compassionate, is blissful. His grace is everlasting. The fruits received from such sadhana do not decay. If God is not like this, how can he remain unblemished? How could this universe be so well regulated? The countries of kings whose administrations are not well managed fall apart. But the universe runs smoothly and seems well organized by the grace of the compassionate Lord. A brief comment here. We're talking about the nature of the universe here and the Purarahas here says it's the conscious principle and it is this conscious principle that leads the way. That is the way. It is making a comparison with employers who pleased with good, honest employees reward them. So also it says that if you are a good, sincere seeker and if you perform your sadhana, you do your sadhana, then you will attain and the fruits attained or received from such a sadhana do not decay. That is, that will last. Wealth, riches, all these things do not last. Material objects do not last. But sadhana, the impressions from this sadhana, do not decay. And so, this is the law of karma. So if this law of karma would not work this way, it would all fall apart. The entire universe and the way it works would fall apart. It compares it with countries which are run smoothly as opposed to countries which are not run smoothly. If the administration does not work, it all falls apart. But the universe seems to run smoothly. It's well organized because there are certain laws in place. These are the laws of Karma. So if you perform your action, your sadhana, you will receive the fruit from it and that fruit will not decay. It is everlasting. Which means through a law of evolution, you will evolve to higher and higher levels of consciousness. Himalekha continues. There are two methods used by seekers for attaining the absolute reality. Having desires and being desireless. Those who surrender themselves without any hesitation are guided by providence. Among many approaches to, God, to realizing God, the first is to remove the obstacles. The second is to gain the means. And the third is is to com is complete dedication and self surrender self surrender is the surest of all methods people of the world worship god to fulfill their desires 
As a result, their mundane desires are fulfilled. However, the worship should be sattvic. Sometimes they commit mistakes in their way of worship and become indifferent. Therefore, such aspirants laden with desires receive limited fruits or the fruits remain uncertain. But one who performs his worship selflessly gains mastery over all worldly objects. The ignorant do not know the higher worship of desirelessness, but the Lord, being omnipresent, is the governor of everyone's hearts. He knows everything and gives the fruit immediately. Those whose sadhana is full of desires receive the fruits accordingly to the nature of their sadhana. The Lord of life helps those who have successfully surrendered themselves to attain the highest goal. To comment shortly on this, one of the most important ways to realize the self or God is the first step is to remove obstacles. The second is to gain the means which is have techniques, methods, systematic approach, all these things. But first and foremost, we need to remove obstacles. When we have removed the obstacles or the entire process of removing obstacles is generally an ongoing process, we also acquire the means, we do sadhana, we do our practice and at some point of time you do reach a stage where having done everything within your power, within your human uh, what is humanly possible, you reach a point where you surrender because you come to a point where you feel that you cannot continue on your own and that's when grace comes. When there is self-surrender at some point, that's when grace comes. This grace has many different names. It's called Kripa, it's called Shaktipat, it's called Sambhavi Diksha, it has different names. But this comes only when one has removed obstacles and acquired the means, performed the sadhana and reached a point where you need that grace. That grace comes to you. This is quite different from the idea that people have you go um, to a seminar or to a gathering where some teacher for $1,000 or whatever amount uh, gives Shakti part to masses of people. And that is not really Shakti part. That may be giving some sort of mantra, maybe some sort of diksha. But Shakti part means descent, descent of Shakti, which is a divine act. And that comes when you have done everything possible, everything humanly possible, and can no longer do anything. The Lord or God, who is the governor of your heart, knows already what you want. And so when you do sadhana, you will find, if you do it systematically, if you do it in a way that's sincere, and your mind becomes more and more one-pointed, you will find that your desires are fulfilled. If you have mundane desires, then the mundane desires will be fulfilled. So, those whose heart is full of desires will receive these limited fruits. And these fruits accrue to you quite, quite quickly and according to the nature of your sadhana. Any questions so far? Any thoughts so far? Alright. 
So the Lord of Life helps those who have successfully surrendered themselves to attain the highest goal. Supreme Lord Maheshwara is kind and merciful and always graces his devotees by fulfilling their desires. The law of predestiny, sorry, the law of predestiny loses its power for the sadhaka. It is known that in the case of the great devotee Markandeya, the Lord blessed him with a rare boon. Let me explain the reason. Karmic laws are inevitable, but a fortunate few remain unaffected by these laws because their karma are already exhausted. Life on this platform cannot be sustained without prana. One can escape from the karma of his past lives by mastering the highly evolved practice of pranayama. Those who are not spiritually oriented and do not practice are tossed inevitably by prarabdha, the past karmas that have started producing their fruits. This is the law of karma. Niyati, the power of law, is the power of the Lord and its real nature is sankalp, firm determination. The Lord is truth and firm determination. Therefore, the law cannot be dissolved. This law is not applicable to the fortunate few or to exceptional devotees. This aspect of the law is like a bridge for devotees. Therefore, dismiss polemics. Take refuge in Maheshwara. He will help you attain the highest good. In the ladder of attainment, bliss is the final rung and nothing else is worthwhile. Hema Lekha explains very beautifully and very simply that Lord Maheshwara is kind and merciful. Once again, to clarify, Lord Maheshwara is not referring to a deity. We are not talking about Shiva, a blue-skinned god with cobras around his neck. No, this is referring to the self. Maheshwara is Shiva or Atman or the Self, your true nature, pure consciousness. And this is, is eternal, it is, it is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent and it will always grace you by fulfilling your desires. However, everybody has some karmic baggage. We all are carrying karmic baggage and this is basically the summation of your samskaras which have developed over many past lives and these must bear fruit. It's like taking a loan from the bank. You always have to pay it back. It doesn't matter how you pay it, whether you pay it really in very large installments very quickly or you pay it in shorter installments over a longer period of time. But you still have to pay back your loan. So, also, the karmic law demands that you pay it back, that the karmic debt through sadhana, one can speed up that process. So it's like paying a larger amount of your credit. And so you only require a short period of time to pay it back. And if you do not do any sadhana, that can take many, many lifetimes, during which time you will acquire more karma, more debts. <laughs> so the process becomes almost endless. So the way out is to... Through intense practice, pay back your karmic debts and not gather any more. But for a few rare devotees or practitioners, they are unaffected by the laws of karma because they have already been exhausted. They have gone beyond the laws of karma. 
And this is possible. That's exactly why we are here. That's what we all want to do. When you say, I want to be free from suffering, I want to be free from pain and misery, what you mean is, I don't want to be affected by the law of karma. I want to go beyond this law of karma. And that's possible when you become a witness or a jiva and mukt. Then it's possible that you have to live out stuff, but it will not touch you. It will not cause pain or suffering because you will always remain a witness. To be able to do that, you must master pranayama to escape from the karma of past lives. If you do not or if you cannot do that, you will be tossed around by your past karmas. They are called prarabdha. Prarabdha karma is karma that is now starting to ripen. The example given in the Upanishad texts are it's like a archer who has taken an arrow out of his quiver and he's already shot one arrow. That arrow is gone. It has reached the target or whatever. He cannot influence that anymore. So that is with the past karma, which have now started to bear fruit. You have no longer any control over that. That is starting to bear fruit. But you can have some power over the, the arrows which are still in the quiver or the one that you are about to shoot. That's the present and the future. So that karma you can change. So this paragraph here is telling us about karma. And the way to go beyond karma is through sankalpa. And only by doing practice, sadhana, Mastering pranayama, can we go beyond it? So, Himalaya says, dismiss polemics. Polemics means just arguments, discussions, debates. Forget all this intellectual reading, intellectual knowledge. Take refuge in Maheshwara. Surrender. Do your sadhana. And nothing else is worthwhile. Any questions or thoughts? O Parshurama, after listening to his wife, Hema Chuda was delighted and continued his queries. Hema Chuda asked, Darling, please describe the nature of this Maheshwara, who is ultimate refuge, the one who is a doer of all, absolutely self-existent and the controller of the entire universe, is known by various names. Devotees call him Vishnu, Shiva, Ganesh, Surya, Narsimha, Buddha, Sugata, Arhat, Vasudeva, Prana, Soma, Agni, Karma, Pradhan, Anu and many other names. Those of you who have some background will know that this is very interesting because the names are from many different communities. So the Vishnu is those who follow Shiva, uh, sorry, Krishna or Vishnu are the Vaishnavites. Shiva is those who follow the Shivaite community or Shiva. 
then there's Ganesh. Surya in those days was a very powerful deity and had many followers, but that is no longer existing. These, these, these group of sun worshippers are not very strong anymore. Narasimha, also a form of Vishnu, Buddha, the Buddhist community, Sugata, Arhat, Vasudeva, again a form of Krishna, Prana are the Pranavadins. Soma, Agni, were from the Vedic times. Karma, those who are understanding it from a yogic perspective. Pradhan is Sankhya philosophy. So, almost everybody is covered. The cause of the universe is described in various ways. Can you tell me where and how God-oriented buddhi is used? I am sure you know everything. Because the great sage Vyagrapada, your godfather, is the knower of all, and he has taught you everything. That is why, being a woman, you have profound knowledge. Darling, you are as sweet as nectar, and your teachings are helpful. Tell me the secrets, for I am a devotee. After being asked by her husband, Himalekha happily said, Lord, listen, I will explain about God. So basically, what he wants to know, what Hema Chuda wants to know is, what are the qualities of God? So those were the different names given to God, the self. God sounds pompous whenever we say God, <laughs> but we use different words for it. Pure Consciousness, Maheshwara, Shiva, everybody coming from different traditions, religions, approach it in different ways. And Himalekha now will explain more about the qualities of Pure Consciousness or God. The one from whom the world springs, who is responsible for the manifestation of the world and where it rests in the end is God. The name, the same is called Shiva, Brahma, Surya and Chandra. In all names and all forms, God alone is seen. He is beyond forms and the names of Shiva, Vishnu and Brahma. Listen attentively. Now I reveal a great secret. Shivites consider the five-faced and three-eyed Shiva to be the creator of the universe. Pay attention, I will tell you. If the primal cause of the universe has five faces and three eyes, then that being which has a form is subject to change, death and decay. Mind functions in dreams without the help of the physical body to express its dormant desires. This indicates that a body is an instrument of the individual soul. Human beings need instruments to express themselves because of their limitations, whereas the creator of the universe, being perfect in itself, does not need any aid. This means that God is not any particular person. Only God is sovereign, and without the aid of another, has manifested the world. Therefore, it is concluded that God is never embodied in any form. Otherwise, he would depend on some sort of instrument in order to create the world. World was never created, but was manifested. All these forms of the world have been manifested by him, yet he is beyond all names and forms. God being omnipotent, omnipresent and omniscient is the sovereign power without a second. God cannot be perceived. He projects the universe. The ignorant remain confused about formless absolute reality. In their ecstasy, they visualize the supreme in different forms. According to the nature of their devotion, God assumes various forms and fulfills their desires. He is formless, absolute, pure consciousness. Consciousness is transcendental and is beyond all three states of mind, waking, dreaming and sleeping, 
and it is named Tripura. Though this universe is inseparable from her, it appears to be separate and the same as Vishnu and Shiva. Therefore, you should not consider them separate. They are one and the same. The entire universe is a reflection of pure consciousness. Consciousness is non-dual. Therefore, there is nothing superior or inferior. It is in respect to lower forms, states of consciousness, that people consider some forms of God to be more significant than others. They are but projections of the human mind. Therefore, a wise man should worship or meditate only on the absolute state of consciousness, beyond names and forms. However, those who are not capable of comprehending the absolute should selflessly and with full dedication Worship God in any name or form that is pleasing to them. Even if one is born a million times, he will not find another way. So here, Himalekha explains what many of us have been hearing and listening very often in these meetings. The nature of God and Tripura. So Tripura is the waking. The waking is, as you know, the part which is the world, the body, part of the breath, is all part of the world and so is the conscious mind. And this is the conscious part, the waking state. The dreaming state is this part here, the active unconscious mind. Then comes the latent or the deep sleep and that's this part here. So this is, Tripura means three cities. Three means three and Pura means cities. This is the first city we live in. This is the second city we live in and this is the third city we live in. And who is living in these three cities? God, the self, Atman, pure consciousness and that's here, the center of consciousness. And that is what is living in these three cities. Here it's like a map that has been opened out. But you know that the center of consciousness is deep within us. And it looks out through the latent, active and conscious mind into the world. And this is God. This is center of consciousness or pure consciousness. And so while we generally are lost in this world of forms out here, forms and names out here in the world, this part of the world, we are not able to really relate to this aspect of the center of consciousness which is formless because we cannot relate to it most of us have difficulties in understanding this so Himalekha says that the wise man will focus only on the formless which is center of consciousness and those who cannot do that they can continue to focus on some deity or some form or tradition in a tradition some follow certain teachers and um, or have certain icons or symbols that they worship and they should continue to do that So we see that the entire reflection is pure, a reflection of pure consciousness. So Tripura, the three worlds, are a reflection of pure consciousness. Any questions? Thoughts? Comments?
okay. And then the dialogue between sage Himaleka and Hema Judah continues. So now we see from the title that Himaleka is now the sage. In the earlier chapters, she was princess, and now her true self has been unmasked or revealed, and Hema Judah has accepted this. She has accepted his wife as his teacher. After learning the nature of the great goddess Tripura, Himachuda's mind became calm. Then he studied with learned masters from whom he understood the sagun form of the goddess, the form that has attributes. Blessed with the grace of Maheshwara, the great lord, he began to practice meditation on Tripura with full determination and dedication. After several months of worship, grace dawned in him, and his outward-oriented mind one-pointedly turned inward. Therefore, his mind became indifferent to pleasures. This is not possible without the grace of God. When the seeker's mind is totally engrossed in the search of truth, then it becomes a means of liberation. O Parshurama, countless may be the methods a seeker uses, but he will fail if the correct method for attaining truth is not applied. To comment on this, he worshipped in a way that his mind, his outward-oriented mind, turned inward. This is a very important aspect we need to understand because as long as the mind is focused outward, it is very difficult for us to fathom these deep truths. It doesn't mean that you cannot function anymore in the outward world, but what it means is that our concepts change, our approach to the world dramatically changes. Those who remain focused on external objects or external means of worship, such as deities, etc., they will have difficulties at turning inward. So this process of turning inward is really grace. This is also grace. Attaining God self-realization is, of course, the highest grace, but this is also grace. It is very auspicious when something shifts in the person and he begins to look inward for answers to deep, profound questions and no longer seeks these outside in books, in deities, in rituals or, or whatever other external means. And such a mind becomes a means of liberation. O oh, Parshurama, countless may be the methods a use, seeker uses, but he will fail if the correct method for attaining truth is not applied. What is the correct method? Correct method is one that is systematically leading inward. The big reason why most people fail is that they do not have a systematic method and the method is not leading inwards. I have many students coming to me from other teachers or traditions and when they tell me what they've been doing previously, it is very clear that there is no system behind it and the method is not leading inwards. It is mostly remaining either focused on the external or at some level of the mind. And that is why such methods are bound to fail. They're bound to fail because they're not correct. <clears throat> so 
Some time later, he went to meet his wife. His mind was completely absorbed in the search for truth. Whenever Hemachuda saw his wife, his mind was inspired to attain truth. When his wife saw him coming, she welcomed him and offered him a seat respectfully. Reverently, she washed his feet, prostrated in front of him and spoke gently. Just a short comment here. Those were the traditions of that time that the women did these things. I know that some women, when they read this, get very upset about it. It's just a matter of you know, culture of those days. And that's, that's how it works. Oh Lord, Himalekha said, I've not seen you for a long time. Are you healthy? The body is prone to sickness. How are you? You have not thought about me for a long time. You used to say you could not even spend a day without seeing me. How did you spend your time without me? I know you would not go anywhere else without asking me, even in a dream. You would always say that a single moment without my company was like thousands of years. Please tell me, what has happened? How did you spend your nights without me? With these remarks, she embraced him. In spite of her embrace, Hemachuda did not feel any excitement. He told her, Sweetheart, you should not be attached to me like this. I know you now. You have no cause to worry because you know the reality beyond cause and effect. You are the embodiment of patient. patience. How can you be deluded? Please explain the story of your life to me. Who is your mother? Who were your maid servant? and her husband, who were her sons, and tell me, when did I come in contact with them? I do not think I understand your story correctly, yet I cannot believe it was a lie. Surely you were conveying something symbolically. Please explain it to me clearly, so I can understand it properly. I am very happy with you. Please remove the doubt from my heart. So now, we know that Hemachuda has been so deeply affected by her teachings that he has completely transformed. He is really not so interested anymore in these intimacies and he is only interested in getting to the bottom of this mystery, mystery of the three cities. So he refers back to this incredible story that she told him that we read about the maidservant and her husband and the sons and it was really a very strange story and quite clearly he was confused by it. He did not understand the symbolic meaning but now he asks her to Clarify. Hearing these words, Himalekha's face glowed. She felt that through the grace of the Supreme Being, the prince's mind had become purified. Through the grace of the Divine Force, he had patiently withdrawn his mind from worldly objects. His virtuous, virtuous deeds were beginning to bear fruit. Recognizing that the time for his self-realization was very near, Himalekha decided to impart more spiritual wisdom. She said, To the grace of the Lord, your good fortune has risen. Without good karma, no one experiences indifference to material objects. This is the first symptom of the grace of the Lord. Second symptom is becoming aware of the pettiness of the charms of the world through discrimination. Now I will explain the journey of the self, which I have described to you before. So this, what she explained, the story that she had explained was the journey of the self. So let us follow her and try to understand that allegorical story. Pure consciousness is my mother. The intellect or buddhi 
is my servant. Ignorance charms and distracts the intellect is the great enemy of the faculty of discrimination. So the power of ignorance is immense and can delude anyone. So great attachment is the child of ignorance, which had an unsteady son called mind. His wife is an imagination. He had five sons. So the mind itself had five sons. Hearing, taste, sight, touch and smell. Sense gratification becomes their samskaras. They dwell in the sense organs. Being embryoed with sensory objects becomes the habit of the mind. The mind carries those objects back to its own abode to enjoy them in dreams. Expectation, the unstable glutton, is the sister of imagination. She produces anger and greed. Their dwelling place is the body, the city of life. Prana and mind are the twin laws of life and function in tandem. Without knowing the highest purpose of life, this world becomes the source of pain and confusion for the human mind. The highest attainment in which the mind, with all its faculties, attains a state of tranquility is called Samadhi. My admission into the inner chamber of my being is emancipation. Thus have I explained the story of my life and your story is the same. May you be absorbed in Samadhi and attain the highest good. So what Hemalekha had told him, this fascinating story, this incredible story, was in fact a description of what we know so well as the yogic anatomy. Very simply put here in this as here, pure consciousness is the mother. Buddhi or discrimination is existing there. So is avidya or ignorance. The mind is the sun. So this entire mind here is the sun. And it explains that the mind again had children which were the senses, these senses here. So this story is everyone's story, not just Himalekas, not just Himachuras, it's also our story. It's everyone's story. And this is the story of how we get attached, how imagination comes into play, how our mind comes up with different creative ideas, so a fascinating story told by Himalekha and now she explained its deeper meaning. Any questions about that story, about this diagram? Okay, we come to chapter 9. After the sermon given by Himalekha, Hema Chuda attains enlightenment. That's nice. Hema Chuda was amazed at this exposition and said, Princess, you are truly great. Your wisdom is immense. How can I praise the profundity of your teachings? 
I have never heard such a story before. Now I can see its inner significance as clearly as if I were gazing at a small fruit on the palm of my hand. Now I remember an experience that stayed within me. How amazing is life? But tell me, who is my mother, Supreme Consciousness, and how was I born from her? Tell me who we are and what we are. O Parshurama, thus asked by Hemachuda, Himalekha replied, Lord, I will reveal that deep secret. Listen respectfully with a one-pointed and purified mind. The self cannot be preached or described. How can I explain? The moment you know yourself, you will know your mother. No one can teach you about the nature of the self. For the intellect through which a person thinks is also dependent on Atman. You can recognize the self only through that self. So in these few lines, Himalekha says very clearly, no one can teach you about the self. We can, we can read this text, we can discuss these things. But the reality is that you know the self only through the self. Even the intellect, which we are using right now, buddhi, to think and to understand, is dependent on pure consciousness, on that self. So it is only when you have a glimpse of that state of witness or become established in it, that you understand what self is. The entire universe, from the grossest to the subtlest, is known through the Atman. That Atman can be experienced only through knowledge, but is never the object of knowledge itself. It is beyond description, time, space and causation. Even the best of teachers cannot show you the light of your eyes. The self is realized with the glory of the self alone. Yeah, that's a lovely line here. The best of teachers cannot show you the light of your eyes. That's the light with which you see everything around you. So you know the glory of the self only by knowing the self. The master's role is only to reveal the path leading to the supreme reality. All I can do is show you the way to absolute truth. Be attentive. Any object that you consider yours is different from your real self. Go into solitude and discriminate what is you and what is not. The self lies beyond cognition. For example, I am your wife. I am related to you, but I am not you. Renounce everything that you consider yours. The self can never be renounced. By knowing the self, you will be liberated. So, that is also the reason why the sages always said, Neti Neti, not this, not this. Because everything that you can, can eliminate, you, can, you know that you are not all the objects around you. You know that you are not all the, the people around you. You look at your body, you can see it, but it is your body, it's your mind. And then there is something that cannot be renounced, and that is the self. Having received these instructions from his wife, Emma Chuda mounted his horse and left the city. He reached his garden, as beautiful as a garden of Indra, in which there was a crystal temple. He entered the temple. He left all his servants outside and ordered the guards to allow no one to enter while he was contemplating, not even the ministers, teachers or his father, the king. He climbed up to the ninth story of the temple. From there he saw the scene all around him. He sat down on a cushion made of cotton, made his mind one-pointed and began, to con began contemplating. During that time, he was all alone. 
for some of you who would like to know there are some little hints and little symbols here that you might be interested in he he went to the garden where there was a crystal temple so the garden is the world around us full of beautiful things fruit and you know wonderful smells and all sorts of things and there's a crystal temple the temple is the body and he entered and climbed to the ninth story of the temple the ninth story at the ninth level is the sahasrara chakra that's the ninth story of the temple so that is that means he has now reached the point where he can witness and from here he can see the scene all around him so it's a nice little hint can see all around him okay ah laro that's nice to have you laro arium you join a little bit late if i if i if, um, if you've just joined right now because now is actually when we end we started about an hour ago So that is the ninth story of the temple. <laughs> Any questions, comments about about this? Radhika ji. Mm -hmm. Yes, Manisha. I have a, a question. Um, generally. Related to the session, part of what uh, was discussed earlier, mm -hmm. how is it that one can ascertain the sincerity of um, one's seeking through your action? When somebody is really sincere, you know from the person's action what he is really doing. If you really want something from your own action or from another person's action, you can tell. So if somebody says, I want to top my class, but is partying every day and not studying, you know that there is a gap between what he is saying and what he really wants. Because if somebody really wants to top the class, he is going to put aside everything else and one-pointedly study for his, you know, whatever, exams or whatever it is. So from your actions, you yourself can tell what it is you really want. And so... Also, that's how a teacher recognizes really sincere students or um, the level of a student from the actions of the student and not from what they're saying. Students say a lot of different things, <laughs> but it's the action that finally tells you what he or she wants. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so since we have come to the end of our hour, we, we can stop here. It's actually a good point to stop since he has, Emachuda has climbed up to the ninth story of the crystal temple in the beautiful garden. And you can see all around him, he is contemplating one pointedly. We can leave him alone here and come back next Saturday and find out what he contemplated upon. 
So have a nice weekend everybody and maybe Laura next time you can make it an hour earlier. If you join in one hour earlier then you'd be right on time. Okay. Thank you everybody. Thank you uh, very Manisha Nita. Pranam everybody and goodbye.